We are really delighted to welcome Roxanne Farman Farmanian to campus. I feel like I should lead you in a recitation of her name, so you'll have it down perfectly. But a as her name suggests, she is the product of two worlds, both the United States, where her mother is from, and Iran, where her father comes from one of the most prominent families in the country. Roxanne, um, Dr. Farman Farmanian holds a PhD from Cambridge University. Her earlier career was in journalism. She has lived in the Middle East, um, lived in Iran during the hostage crisis and during the revolution, so has a unique viewpoint from that, from that side. And also has lived in the Second World, was in Mo Moscow as the Soviet Union moved towards a a crash. She came to academics after a distinguished career in journalism and is now affiliated with the Center for Middle East Studies at Cambridge University and um, good for us is at the University of Utah as affiliated faculty right now. So we are very pleased to have you with us. We look forward to your insights. Donna Lee, thank you very much, Dr. Bowen, for having me, and it's wonderful to be here. And I must say, I, this is a topic I talk about quite a bit, and um, I gave a speech in May and thought, okay, I'll just update it. And what is amazing is, I, as I went back over to the speech, I realized in four months, everything had changed. Now, what I was going to talk about was, you know, I could sort of revisit Egypt and tell about the uh, changes that have taken place since the demonstrations uh, through Mubarak out. I could talk about their new constitutional debates and their social media. I could also talk about Tunisia, I figured, after Ben Ali was gone and discuss the Islamic uh, development in their politics and their constitutional debate. I could talk about the eclipse of Al-Qaeda, and I could also talk about the reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah and what that might mean for the upcoming uh, negotiations on the peace process. Well, looking back on that speech, I threw that out and I have started again. Because major events have so changed the picture, and let me give you a couple of examples. Four months ago, which was when I gave the May speech, the situation in Libya was completely unclear. Gaddafi still held half the country. We heard a lot about Benghazi. The rebels were a rabble without any real cohesion, few military ca capabilities. Uh, they were hardly what we would call a fighting force. We think of today as Libya resolved. The Battle of Tripoli has taken place. We're, they're talking about constitutions and bringing in multi-different parties. The uh, sideline are the skirmishes that seem to be taking place in trying to get rid of Gaddafi from his two small town strongholds. At the moment, we've already seen the new uh, National Council giving a speech at the UN and they've started their oil flowing again, and they're making requests to have their funds unfrozen. So that has been a completely different story from four months ago. Four months ago, Turkey and Israel were allies. The UN flotilla report wasn't out, but now that it is, there has been no Israeli apology, which has led Turkey to break off diplomatic relations, to cut military uh, operations that had up till then been shared completely, to freeze all the trade ties, to threaten placing mil Turkish military warships in the Mediterranean, and on Erdogan, Prime Minister Erdogan's recent tour, he has spoken out very strongly against the Israelis and in fact called them the West's spoiled child. For Israel, this has been a serious setback. If we think back, 
When Ben-Gurion, who was a general at the time, was part of the proclamation of Israel's uh, independence in 1948, he clarified what became known as the Iron Wall policy, which was the insurance that Israel would retain superior military capability over any possible Arab neighbor. And this was backed by the US in law that was enshrined uh, to provide a commitment that that would take place for Israel from then on. That policy was backed by what was called the periphery policy, which was the arrangement that because Israel could not be really close friends with its direct Arab neighbors, it would create strong friendships with a larger periphery, which at the time included the Shah's Iran, and Turkey. And of course, when the Shah's Iran fell, that was rather a setback, but the timing was so perfect because Camp David had just taken place. And so in a sense, Egypt had made a peace treaty which ensured that Egyptian military would not be posted anymore on the Sinai, which in effect took Egypt out of the running in terms of a threat. So that somehow balanced out. However, today, the loss of Turkey is a very different thing. It has isolated Israel. What's more, ambassadors have been sent home from two of its other closest allies, from Egypt, as we know, but also from Jordan. What's more, Egypt is now talking about rethinking the treaty and to re uh, post Egyptian military on the Sinai. And the spat with Turkey is turning out, turning out to be just at the time when Turkey itself is rising and rising into a flowering power in the Middle East. Now, another example of what has changed, four months ago, there was barely a whisper that the Palestinian president, Abbas, would bring Palestinian statehood to the UN, something that we already know has happened today. Hamas, which had been developing a reconciliation with Fatah, and that was the big news, has not supported that move. And so there is a breakdown again. But, what this has highlighted today is that we see a very united Arab front clashing increasingly closer with a US-Israeli front. Now you might remember, four months ago, Netanyahu and President Obama had very cool relations. In the summer, President Obama gave a speech in which he defined the peace issue according to the terms of the 67 borders and the two-state relationship that he uh, wanted to negotiate from there. Today, the whole resonance of that and the Cairo speech are behind us. His speech at the UN was a complete and unadulterated support for Israel and for Israeli settlements. Now, there are two more examples of things that have changed. One is, of course, that Syria, four months ago, was a sideshow. There were a few border uprisings, and it was simply not on the same scale as the other aspects of this Arab Spring. Now, of course, Syria is front and center. The US and the, U and the EU have both called for Bashar al-Assad to step down. There are hundreds of refugees sitting on the border across in Turkey. The whole Shia crescent seems to be at risk. And Iran and Saudi are increasingly engaged in a proxy war of rivalry over this core of the Arab world. Four months ago, Yemen was in turmoil, but its president was still there. President Saleh was talking reform, but killing people in the streets. 
Since then, his palace has been bombed. He was seriously injured. He went to Saudi Arabia. He was cured, and he's back, still killing people in the streets and still talking about democratic changeover. So based on these significant changes, I thought I'd better rewrite the speech. So let me take a step back and look at where is the Arab world now then? And where are we in terms of US policy? First, let me give you a little bit of context, which is sort of like underwear. We don't need a lot, but we need to deal with it first. <laughs> Let's look at the larger geopolitical picture. Okay, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, until the Cold War came to an end, the Middle East in many ways can be thought of as having been amazingly cohesive. With Turkey and Iran being the outliers and the rest very contained, there were the moderate Arab pro-West countries and there was the radical cres Shia crescent that nonetheless, although it was menacing, was contained. With the fall of the Soviet Union, we have to think of the whole geography of the Middle East as changing. It, in fact, was pushed northward and eastward to include Afghanistan, to include the Central Asian republics, possibly to even include as far back as Pakistan. And what this meant is that Turkey and Iran are now in the center of the Middle East. At the same time, the whole region fragmented into blocks. And these are subregions that have very different interests. And let me take these in turn. First of all, we have North Africa, the southern Mediterranean littoral. It is linked in terms of many aspects of its influence and interest to the EU and to the European uh, region. A very good example of this is the French and British-led NATO attack and intervention into Libya. This was not US. In fact, it was a very good lesson for the uh, Europeans in NATO that the United States wasn't always going to lead, and in fact, it wasn't always going to pay the bills, which the Europeans hadn't been great about until then. Libya has changed this. The EU is very dependent in terms of oil on Algeria and on Libya, which is getting back on again. It has also dedicated an enormous amount of energy within the EU process itself to try to bring North Africa into uh, a southern and northern Mediterranean organization. We see the Barcelona process, we see the neighborhood process, nation building efforts, most of which would have not been very successful, but nonetheless show the interlinkage between that region and the European. The next block we see is Egypt which has become, in many ways, very alone. Back to actually what it was prior to Nasser. It is focused on the Nile. It is between Africa, North Africa, and uh, the Arab world. And it is the front on one aspect of the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Its revolution is far from complete. It's made more change, actually, probably on the international front than on the domestic front. And it is the recipient of an enormous amount of aid from Saudi Arabia and from Turkey, neither of which carry any strings. It is simply to ensure that they remain friends. The third block we, we see is the Levant, with Syria at its core. and. The Levant is very much within the spheres of int interest and influence of Turkey and Iran. No NATO intervention here, I can just assure you. Lebanon is, of course, still very much part of this and caught within the Syrian sphere. 
Israel has been very quiet about the uprisings in Syria. And that is because Bashar Assad represents a certain predictability. Though it may not support him, certainly any successor may well prove more problematic for Israel when it comes to the Golan Heights. We also see that Iraq is supporting Syria. Although it's often blamed for being simply a proxy of Iranian relations and push, in fact, one of the things that's often overlooked is that during the Saddam era, the two main leaders of Iraq, Maliki and Alawi, spent significant time in Damascus. And by having given those two leaders uh, a haven and a base from which to operate against Saddam, they're not turning on uh, the Assads at this point. So there is quite a bit of relationship there and a degree of support. Now the next area is, of course, the Gulf littoral. Here we have the home of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the real home of oil, and the massive financial giants that those small emirates and Saudi Arabia have turned into. It's still linked tightly to the United States, but the Arab Spring slash Arab Summer has certainly brought changes there as well. And we have seen Saudi Arabia begin to flex muscles that we've actually never seen before. In the wake of the Arab Spring, Saudi Arabia and the larger GCC extended its invitation to Morocco and Jordan to join it, to become a coalition of monarchies. And this was not simply in order to provide strength of monarchies, but as one step in a multi-step process of trying to contain Iran. Last week, I had the opportunity of speaking to the uncle of the Jordanian uh, king. Uh, he's the ambassador from Jordan at the UN, Prince Zain al Hussein, and he said, this is not an easy choice for the Jordanians to make. The aid is great, but what are the strings that come along with it? The view of the Jordanians in terms of human rights does not parallel that of Saudi Arabia. So these kinds of things are not easy inside the Middle East. Saudi Arabia also attempted to organize another large uh, coalition of Sunni states to contain Iran that went well beyond the Middle East, including what I would say the new Middle Eastern states of cent the Central Asian republics, but likewise Malaysia, Indonesia, this was very much viewed with negativity by Washington that was concerned it might divide the Shia from the Sunni and didn't go far, but its very uh, public uh, presentation certainly suggests that the policy of containing Iran has become more volatile, more rhetorically obvious, more official, coming out of the GCC bloc. Now, when Saudi moved to uh, contain the Bahraini uprising, it was certainly part of that containment of Iran. But one has to ask oneself, is that all it was? Is Bahrain really independent anymore? Or is it somehow part of a move to create a Saudi version of homeland security, where that whole area now is being monitored by a lot more military and intelligence in order to ensure that the Arab Spring does not come knocking too strongly upon its doors. The GCC states, having the money, paid off their populations for a period of quiet. But this does not come free to any of us. The amount the Saudi Arabian monarchy promised their population is over $1.3 billion. What does that translate into? It translates into 18 to $24 a barrel, which means that the cost and value per barrel of Saudi oil for its own uh, accounting 
has moved from being $65 a barrel to somewhere between $88 and $84 a barrel. This is a cost we all pay for the concerns that monarchy and the other monarchies have in that region. Finally, Saudi Arabia is stretching it wi its wings vis-a-vis -vis us, the United States. Before the Palestinian vote, Prince uh, al-Turki al-Faisal, a member of the, uh, the monarchy, and uh, who used to be head of the uh, intelligence and was ambassador to Britain, so he is an official voice, wrote a piece in the International Herald Tribune warning the United States, should it veto the Palestinian proposal for statehood, this would complicate and perhaps change fundamentally the special relationship between Saudi Arabia and the US. And he called it a vote that would be seen as, quote, toxic by the vast majority of Arabs and that therefore Saudi Arabia would be forced to look elsewhere to make friends. And he specified China, India, and Russia. So we see this geostrategic map shifting. And of course, we have the old power civilizations of Iran and Turkey now much more in the center, and both but particularly Turkey, rising in this particular model. But first, let's take Iran. And I have to say, Iran is feeling a, a bit slighted at the moment. It's very used to being at the top of the news, and the Arab Spring and summer have completely pulled the carpet out from under its feet. The Arab Spring, meanwhile, has not been kind to Iran. And this is because in the past, Iran had a completely different approach to the region. It played the Arab street all the time. Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, who is seen as so outspoken and hostile and difficult in terms of Western rhetoric, was seen as one of the only who supported the idea that the dictators were terrible, that they were supported by the West, that they had to go. Likewise, it offered a completely different model its model, an Islamic model, saying this is an option that we think works. You should try it. It's different than the one that you have. The star of Iran likewise seemed to rise as the United States got rid of its enemies on the left and on the right, Saddam and the Taliban in Afghanistan. But Although it claimed that the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt were exactly like its own Islamic revolution in 1979, wiping away the Shah, and that its uh, support was for the people, in fact, this rang hollow when it put down its own uprising uh, to create reforms that took place also at the end of February of this year. Bahrain was a big setback for Iran as well. Because although it was blamed, it was in no position to go and support the Shia. It wasn't going to start a war by arriving on the uh, beaches of Bahrain with warships. And so it was shown to have been out, it put in a position of letting down those very people that had said, I will, we will always support you. For Syria, that has been the real breaking point for, for Iran. Syria is of a significant importance to Iran. It's a fundamental pillar of the Shia crescent. It's an old friendship that goes back all the way to the time of the Iran-Iraq war. It's Iran's only major Arab ally. And of course, it's a corridor to Hezbollah, which we see is likewise beginning to take its own area of, uh, of operation quite separate from that of Iran these days. At home, Iran also has significant problems and a significant agenda. The sanctions, which have been on Iran for almost, well, on and off for over 25 years, are at last really biting. It's finally, truly getting to the Iranian street. Iran itself is going into an election cycle. 
Next year, it's going to have parliamentary elections. The year after that, it's going to have presidential elections. And Ahmadinejad will not be reelected. Even if he could be reelected, he has been one of the most costly political adventures of the Islamic Republic. He has alienated both the domestic conservative uh, support that he enjoys, he has thoroughly alienated the international world, and so very likely his successor is going to be someone, though very conservative, who will be quite a bit more emollient, will not bring up the Holocaust, and will very likely try to take the edge off the nuclear uh, negotiations. Iran isn't doing this, however, because of what the West thinks about it. It's doing this because of what's going on in Turkey and what's going on in the Arab world. And so let's for a quick moment turn to Turkey. And this too is one of the most extraordinary parts of this story. Turkey a few years ago was an outcast of the EU. Today, it's the EU that's having financial troubles and Turkey, a member of the G20, is literally turning over as a major economic uh, miracle. It is promoting its model as the real alternative for the Arab Spring, or the Arab Awakening, we better call it that these days. Its model is Islamist secular capitalism. What a combination. And Prime Minister Erdogan's trip has been, in a sense, the promotion of this entire idea. In fact, he arrived to celebrity thousands when he set, uh, took his step off the plane in Cairo and then in Tunisia. He has been probably the most popular non-Arab leader since Saladin 1,100 years ago. And in fact, if one looks at it, he has a good model to use and promote as an inspiration for the crowds that want change in the Arab world. His government has been able to corral the army for the first time in modern Turkish uh, history. Now, it can be argued that the the Cutting of ties with Israel was a significant setback. It's just exactly what one would imagine Islamism to do. However, on this particular tour, his whole message has been secularism. Adopt secular government. And I quote, and this is what he said to the Egyptians, I recommend a secular constitution for Egypt, he said. Do not fear secularism, because it does not mean being an enemy of religion. And this is, meanwhile, at a time when the word secularism is an almost unmentionable word in Egypt. And he finished by saying, I hope I've changed your mind about secularism, and that you will now think about it as a real option. Now, Turkey has been accused in various quarters of uh, neo-Ottomanism, of the sort of rise of the old Ottoman Empire feelings, and of adopting a dark side through its Islamist uh, government. But I would argue that instead, what we're actually seeing is a shift from the old-style secularism of Europe, particularly France, to the American side of uh, secularism. That is where you can be very religious in government and yet still be in government. And for the West, as much as for the Arab world, I would also argue that the Turkish model is a lot better than the Iran model or the Saudi model. And Turkey has backed up its very Eastern orientation, its idea of zero problems with neighbors, with some significant recent moves to assure and settle the West. It just signed a major deal with the US about, the, about placing the missile containment uh, project on its territory to contain Iranian missiles. 
and it has also joined a major anti-terrorism group, something he did in just yesterday. So having quickly gone over these major shifts and changes in power structures and changes in alliances and threats and deals, where does that leave us today? Now, before I launch into that, I do always love the idea that our acronyms seem to say so much about us. The US, we are us. We love everybody to be us. We bring us in, we are us. The EU is all about you. Very normative, trying to make you feel good, not imposing themselves a lot. They learned that, that lesson at, after colonialism. And the Middle East is all about me. We want me, we don't want us, we don't want you. <laughs> so, on that note, let's look at what we have. The Arab summer is over. The era of Al-Qaeda, over. The era of enforced stability, read rigidity. The era of stability that is so locked in that it can't take on the tensions that grow and grow and then suddenly, to our horror and shock, erupt. What has been called in economics, black swans. We can no longer see all changes as leading to the Arab model. Uh, taking on only a trajectory towards the Iran model. We have alternatives now. I would also argue that the era of US hegemony in the Middle East is possibly also over. The era of dictatorships is coming to an end. We need to understand the new motivations, the new trends, the real system. We're in an era of constitution writing of job creation, of youth engagement, of social media, of Islamist activism. What, Islamist activism? Yes, that's exactly what I meant. And the reason is because Islamist activism to us up until now has been anathema. We've thought of moderate and extreme as being all the same. But all paths of Islamist activism doesn't, don't lead to Al-Qaeda. In fact, we've seen that it's been the secular states that have had the revolutions, and we must understand now, before it's too late, what exactly is happening inside the minds and desires of the victorious Arab populations. We have to understand that they are very sensitive to international public opinion. They don't want Al-Qaeda any more than we do, because when Algeria and Hamas had very Islamic elections, the result was a cut in Western funding, a cut in Western support, and a rise in Western Islamophobia. They don't want intelligence services that deny popular rights in the name of anti-jihadism. They do support Palestine. They do support Hamas. They don't support Israel. They're focused on economic change. They want jobs for the youth. They want prosperity. They want globalization. They want dignity. They want a pragmatic change that will combine some kind of coalition of democracy, a degree of Islamic thought, human rights, self-determination, pride. They want to own their democracy. They don't want an awful lot of heckling from the outside. And what this means is US policy, very fundamentally, needs to reboot. And better to do it now than later. The US up until now has in many ways misunderstood the system, which is why it, the whole uprising came as such a shock, a black swan. We have to understand, first of all, how we're viewed. The US and the EU inside the Middle East has a legitimacy problem. There was the Iraq war, which the Arabs hated. 
We supported dictators that the masses have now overthrown. We supported the Washington Consensus, which didn't work. There was no trickle down. There was too much corruption. The food prices went up, and they're still up. The Middle East is not integrated. It needs to be integrated into the world economy. And so I'll very quickly, in the time left to me, suggest a few changes that we need to think about. One is we need to rethink the economics of the place. And to some degree, we're already doing that. However, it's time we also took a page out of what happened with the EU's Barcelona process. It failed because the states inside the Middle East have no common infrastructure. They don't have roads that connect them. They don't have ways to integrate. So they can't sell each other products. They cannot benefit from economies of scale. So before we come up with all these plans of investment, we need to make sure that they can actually develop economies. The cost of their labor is too high because they're so close to the Europeans. And our private investment gets better returns elsewhere, so why should we give it to them? Finally, the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli conflict means there's always a possibility of war. And as anybody in the business world knows, you don't put your investment somewhere that may be close to war. We also need to think, number two, about our export of democracy. Now, democracy is great. We know that. We practice it. But it has gotten a very tainted name in the Middle East where dictators used it to label a lot of their very undemocratic practices. Also, we have to realize democracies don't always turn out friendly to the US. Look at Hamas. They don't always cooperate with the, middle, uh, with the West when they're, when they're elected. They often include Islamist values, which often we don't like. We actually have to get back to the fundamental premise of what democracy really is about, pluralism coalition building, protection of minority rights as well as majority, inclusion. And we have to realize that democracies are very volatile. They are not the stability that today we represent. New democracies are often not very stable. But small changes means we can better see what's going on. No black swans. It'll be more transparent, more flexible. We have to learn to be a little bit more flexible ourselves. Number three, we have got to rethink interests in the Middle East, our interests. It cannot just be oil, security of Israel, and blocking proliferation of WMD, as one of the writers in Foreign Affairs uh, identified them not too long ago. When Obama took office, he didn't even think the Middle East was important. His focus was on Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia. But in fact, the Middle East is absolutely primary to US interests. First of all, we're always involved there. Second of all, there's oil, uprisings, huge wealth, youth, media. We have got to adopt a broader sense of what our general interest is. And I would argue we have got to include in our primary interests the youth. They will inherit the earth and the future of the Middle East. They are tech savvy. They are bold. They are young. And they need education, globalization, more media. They are an opportunity for the United States. We need to rethink our enemies. We have to discover again who is with us and not who is against us. The Muslim world has rethought its en enemies. They include Al-Qaeda, very much because of the legacy of Iraq. They include Iran, because its current religious structure is not what they want, not least because the Iranians do not respect their citizens. We must be sure that the US is not among this new list of enemies. We must rethink 
political Islam. As I mentioned, Islamists are not all equal. We have moderates being ex used as a very good example in Turkey. They can promote pluralism. They are promoting capitalism. We cannot take the EU Council's official designation of all Islamists, moderates included, as dangerous because moderate Islamists lead to extremists. We can't do that. We have to see the Muslim Brotherhood in terms very different than the way we saw Khomeini some time ago. We should look at what the Muslim Brotherhood is saying and its legacy. We should see its huge public rift that took place in Egypt at the time with Al-Qaeda. We should see its ability to be absolutely outraged by what Erdogan was saying about secularity and yet see their call to, to everyone that he is their best model. There are a couple of things we have to take into consideration about what political Islam really means. The Islamist agenda is most extreme when they are not part of the electoral process. Hamas tempered its policies towards Israel, recognizing the 67 borders once it was elected to power. To sideline the Brotherhood or other Islamist problem, uh, organizations means that they will possibly become more extremist. They will possibly turn to greater anti-Americanism. We don't want that. We want to include them as part of the pluralistic function of what we see happening in the Arab world. We need to rethink our whole values in terms of where the Arab world and we stand. We have to think of a stronger, more confident Arab world as not threatening. We must be s very much more sensitive to Arab public opinion we need to be better informed about opposition so they don't catch us by surprise. We need to understand why the Arab world generally supports Hezbollah, why it was outraged by the Gaza war, why it had such anger about the flotilla. We need to recognize why and how to address the Arab world that is anti-Israel and will remain so until peace is established. We must recognize the linkages. For example, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict leads to greater Islamism throughout the region. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict leads to anti-Americanism throughout the region. And anti-Islamism on the part of the United States leads to dictator support. We have to break those circles. We have to recognize that Al-Qaeda is just simply not the, new, the best game in town anymore for the youth. Their own local areas are. And we have to also recognize that the short term is different than the long term. In the short term, Al-Qaeda probably will have a little bit more operating room at the moment. But in the long term, these societies know full well its bite every bit as well as the United States, and containment will continue. This truly is an Arab awakening, not just a spring or a summer or a fall. It's perhaps an Arab decade, maybe an Arab decade or two. It may be unsure, but it holds the future in its hands. It's a moment for writing constitutions assisted by the West and of US retrenchment assisted by the Arab world. It's a period of youth savvy and ambition within the Arab world that's looking for change. There is a lot on this table and quickly changing. And there is much to lose and ours to lose as well. But there is so much to gain. Thank you. A bit long, I'm sorry. <laughs>
Why were you there? Oh, I have to. We can talk about it afterwards because I'm on the committee yeah. for the International Center there. I don't know what your plan is. Anyway, oh. I there's a. My name is Marcus Collister. I'm a biophysics major. I've had interest in the situation in the Middle East for a long time, but other than reading kind of a few articles in the newspaper, haven't been able to follow much. Is there anything you would recommend in getting to know that area of the world? And I mean, with so much changing, how much his, how much, where's the balance between studying the history and studying the situation now, and how should one go about it? I have to admit that history is always useful, but in this area and region, it's particularly useful. Not only because the history has so many layers in such a short period of time, but because um, so many of the roots of what we see today were planted in the recent history, and some of the longer history as well. There are several books. I would particularly recommend one by Gelvin on the modern Middle East because it's short, it's got some of the documents, he's very lucid, and it provides a really good overview. And I would possibly also suggest reading some of the literature coming out of uh, the Middle East. Um, there's one superb one that came out about Libya prior to the fall of Gaddafi called In the Country of Men that is short, and devastating, and I highly recommend it. Because once you realize that Libya, for example, Gaddafi gave it nothing. There was no parliament, there were no structures, there were no institutions, there's no history whatsoever of anybody practicing the art of government. And instead, there's been years of overriding fear. And that particular book makes that terribly clear. So the, the challenges that those who are beginning to run Libya today are facing only become in the least clear if you know where, what they're taking over from. And so I would recommend that you look around for a number of pieces of literature because that way you get the heart as well as the data. Hello, my name is Brian Paul. I am a political science major here at the Y. Obviously, the 20th century and now as we get into 12 years of the 21st century have been marked by these democratic diffusions from ranging from the time of the end of the World War II to the end of the Cold War and to now. What are some of the significant similarities or differences that you see in the terms of the democratic diffusions that are now in the Middle East to some of the ones compared to that have happened in the past? So in the Middle East, but in the past? Yes. That's a really good question. Um, first of all, I think one has to see the process of democratic change as just that, a process, and it's a long one. It's not something where the turnover will deliver all of the mechanisms that just fall into place and suddenly you have this perfect democracy. I mean, if we think about the French Revolution, that took you know, a hundred years to, to finally become a truly democratic society. If we think of our own, in some ways, it has been argued that we really didn't become a truly democratic society until we'd had our civil war. And that certainly took a while after our revolution. So these are long processes. They're, they're aspects of trial and error. In the case of the Middle East, first of all, the very idea of mass revolutions were uh, not really what we could call the previous uprisings. The sense of citizenship that gets established with these kinds of popular uh, movements are relatively rare. And once they've occurred, then there is a complete shift in change. People are no longer subjects. And once you are not a subject, you never become a subject again. Now, perhaps one of the best examples is Algeria because it did have a mass uprising that finally ejected the French, and they developed a mechanism of uh, quote-unquote popular government. But to find any kind of real similarity between what happened at the time in Algeria and what's happening throughout the region today is to underestimate the impact of what colonialism did to these states. So the previous... Um, democratic uprisings in many cases were incredibly problematic processes of trying to eject the European colonial power. 
And that was the purpose of the uprising, the idea of developing a structure, a dignity, a globalized economy. All of that was not really part of, of the issue as much as it is today. What was a part in the past, again, is something that distinguishes that era from today. It was a period when the borders drawn around the countries of the Middle East were new. The Lebanese, for example, thought of themselves as Syria. The Palestinians did too. Um, a lot of these countries had, the Iraqis, brand new country, never existed before. So many of these countries at that time were having to develop an identity, which is a very different process. Understanding the borders that contained their territories, understanding the people that happened to be inside as opposed to the tribes that went across the borders and their own families that lived over on that side. And so that actually has been part of the whole larger democratic process that has in many ways become settled. We have seen few border changes over the last 50 years. And um, perhaps the only significant one is the one that has occurred inside the Palestinian-Israeli uh, territories. Almost all the other very brand new, very strange foreign idea of a border has in fact held, and the people inside each one of those countries have become very much defined by who they are. And so we are in definitely um, phase two or phase three of this whole process. We don't know how many phases we'll go through, but we're not back where they started. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm studying public health and Arabic. Um, I was just wondering where you see women's rights going with all these changes. I've read that in Saudi Arabia, women are getting the right to vote now. But then with the Egypt Revolution, a lot of women are disappointed because their their influence is sort of being pushed out. So where do you, how do you see that changing? Well, first of all, let me talk about Saudi Arabia. Um, great PR move, but every all the women are going to have to wait for four years. Sounds to me like that's in the same box as the 1.3 billion payoff. Quiet down, let's see what happens in four years and then we'll, we'll talk about it again. So um, my sense is that's not a really big step. And I think that that actually is one of the biggest problems of the Gulf Littoral in general and Saudi Arabia in particular. Um, as far as the other areas of revolution, first of all, I think in Tunisia, we're going to see some significant steps forward. It already is a much more balanced society. I mean, you know, you can use the benefit of 2020 vision in retrospect and say, I knew what was going to happen in Tunisia because it had all of the, you know, elements in place that all it needed was a trigger and then out it could go. And I think in many ways we feel generally as scholars that it's got a pretty good chance of a much more balanced society and certainly women will be a, a significant portion of that. Egypt, the women were very much part of that uprising and so um, I think there's great concern on their part that they're not going to be uh, recognized or benefit as much as they had hoped. On the other hand, to put it into the larger picture, at the moment I think everybody in Egypt is feeling that they're not going to try quite get the benefit that they had hoped for. We're seeing that you know the emergency law is in place and being exercised all over again. The electoral law has been considered in many quarters as a total sham. So the issue of women certainly is a problem, but it is not unique in the larger constellation of how that whole uprising now is being translated into practice. But if I could throw in one word, the situation in Turkey is a great model. I think their women are seeing that they can exercise the veil if they want to, they don't have to, they can work in government, they are part of the university system and the academic system, they're very much part of the entrepreneurial system, and uh, there is a very good model of where the restrictions are uh, being lifted and uh, there's greater opportunity. Hi, my name is Annie Samhori. I'm a master's student in sociology. Um, you talked about how the United States is losing its hegemony in the region. Um, and um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, Turkey stated that they were going to be taking a much larger role, um, not a, as uh, like the uh, Ottoman Empire of old, but that they had gained a lot of respect from the Arab world and that they were going to be taking a larger role. What implications do you see? 
what implications do I see of the U.S. losing out on its hegemony and, and Turkey taking on further? What, yeah, what role do you think they will play in the Arab-Israeli conflict? Specifically in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Yes. That I think we don't know yet. Uh, Turkey certainly, Erdogan was saying that, uh, or implying that he would be open and ready to step into the breach. But so far, Turkey has not played a significant role um, ever in that. S Turkey has been much more uh, the negotiator in places such as Tur uh, Syria in the past, not just its current uprising, but in past negotiations with the over the Golan Heights. So in that sense, it has played uh, some experiential role. But of course, the situation with Syria is shifting at the moment, and the Golan Heights seems to be one of the last of the issues that's on the table at the moment. Um, although it's playing its role, there's nothing that's not playing its role at the moment. I think the whole hope is uh, that not only Turkey, but that the BRICS in general, Brazil, uh, maybe not so much Russia, but uh, China, uh, India, and South Africa may become considerably more involved than uh, they have been in various of these Middle Eastern issues. The Turks and the, and the Brazilians got together to try earlier on last year to negotiate uh, a new nuclear pro uh, proliferation uh, treaty and deal with Iran, for example. And the benefit is that they are honest brokers. Unfortunately, the United States is no longer viewed as an honest broker, in it specifically in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So it has lost its traction. The BRICS not only are uh, on it can be seen as honest brokers for no other reason that they have no history of having done any brokering, but because they can much more uh, understand both sides and have been there more recently and can uh, yet bring the clout of their economies and their political leverage. And so I think the hope is actually that they will become much more involved. The question is, how will the United States make room for that? And as long as the United States provides the level of unadulterated support for Israel at the moment, um, there isn't much room. However, because the Obama speech reflected so much domestic uh, political exigency uh, for the upcoming election, it cannot really be seen as the same level of policy um, as perhaps some of his uh, more recent speeches on the on the region, and it certainly and on that particular conflict. And so, I think we can, uh, you know, possibly look forward and say that should he be elected. Uh, again, that that particular uh, support may shift again. Okay, thank you very much.